Hello, everybody. Good morning from the Bay Area West Coast. I wanted to talk a little bit today about mobile testing and let me start by introducing myself. My name is Marcus Merrill. I'm the Vice President of Technology Strategy here at Sauce Labs. I've been here oh, nearly five years now. Uh, and I think it's important just to, to know a little bit more about me. I, I come from a background of um, quality assurance, automated testing, mobile testing. I've been in the industry since uh, around um, around 2001, I believe, is when I got started. Started with API testing, moved on to uh, user interface testing, moved on to mobile testing in the uh, mid-2010s. And then I've done a whole lot of odd job work along the way, um, by which it, I mean dabbling in things like security, uh, accessibility, performance testing, never really pursuing those as careers, but certainly getting familiar with them and getting to understand how they affect the modern world that we live in and and the unbelievably sophisticated software that we are trying to ship these days. Um, at Sauce Labs, as the VP of Technology Strategy, my, my job is to, I guess, more or less assess or appreciate or appraise the platform that we have to offer within our, our uh, within our industry, and then figure out sort of what's missing from it. What are the gaps? What do people want to see out of it? Because I think a lot of folks in this space uh, miss, underestimate, under you know, overestimate. They they look at various ways of you know how can we increase revenue? How can we increase revenue without actually appraising what the users need and uh, delivering that kind of solution in in a way that that really does help give people confidence. And that's what I came here to, to try to solve. I, I think that we're at a unique, somewhat stressful inflection point here in the quality assurance profession that uh, I think it's, it's, it'd be easy for anyone to see that it seems to be that it's a little bit, little bit under threat. And it's also just extremely stressful for those of us who have dedicated our careers to this. It's probably also stressful for folks who are earlier in their career or people who have been, who have fallen into testing to sort of understand what the future is like. And that pressure is compounded by uh, all the headlines you read about how, uh, you know, uh, layoffs and, and various uh, tightening is happening all over the industry. At the same time, though, what I think should give us hope is overall, we're still seeing that no i wouldn't even say we're still seeing we are we are still seeing that low quality software is rampant it's everywhere it, it, it's kind of extraordinary when you think about it like new headlines are being generated every day about issues in software and things that are going wrong at rather high levels and in some cases rather cataclysmically but at the same time our profession is under threat from reductions in force and uh, tightening of budgets so how can we continue to ship software when we're feeling like our, our jobs are unshaky, even though we are arguably the missing piece getting in the way between people and a good software experience? Which makes me want to pivot to the idea of confidence, release confidence. How can you be sure, not just as a QA tester, but as a as a developer or an executive, how can you be sure that you're shipping software that is providing a delightful user experience? Uh, how how can you be certain that, how, how can you have the confidence that it takes to say when we hit the button or when the button is pressed by a robot, how can we be sure that, the confi that, that, that we have released the software to the quality level that we aspire to? And uh, hopefully we'll we'll be talking through some of those topics today. Hopefully I anticipate your questions and I, I hope that we can have a, a good discussion about this. So um, what we're gonna get into is challenges specifically in the mobile area of testing. We're gonna talk about test strategies, which is where I might be inclined to go on a bit of a rabbit hole. And then why Sauce Labs, why Sauce Mobile? Followed by questions and uh, then we'll do a wrap up and I'll pass over to Ashwini for her conversation with uh, with a Forrester analyst. Okay, great, let's get started. What we've witnessed over the past few years is an extraordinary increase in the number of mobile devices and users in the world. It's, it, it's an astonishing number if you think about it, because if you say that there are 7.49 billion projected mobile users worldwide by 2025, 
there are very few people percentage wise left on the planet that aren't mobile users. Um, it makes me wonder, uh, and we have statistics, we have the sources cited on this slide that we'll send out after the, the talk, but um, it makes me wonder certain questions like, um, is this double counting? But ultimately, what we see is there is unbelievable growth within the mobile usage sector. And if you do some mathy math, you see that 255 billion mobile apps were downloaded in 2022. And so this is uh, the 7.5 billion is projected mobile users by 2025. And 255 billion was last year. So let's just reduce the numbers to remaining 6 billion. Let's say 6 billion mobile users in 2022, 255 billion mobile apps downloaded. My bet is you would find that that means that each user on average has downloaded something like 36 apps over the course of that year, which means that, the, I mean, it's an extraordinary number, but at the same time, if you think about it, like really think about how you use your phone and when you need it, you're, you, you probably use only 10, 12 apps in a, in a given day, maybe only three or four if you're boring like me, but at the same time, you kind of need to download new apps all the time. I was looking at the stars the other night. I looked up and one of the stars was moving and I was like, I'll bet you that's a satellite. But I didn't have an app that would tell me. So I downloaded a, an app that would allow me to point my, my phone to the stars. And it told me, yeah, that was a decommissioned Chinese rocket that was orbiting the earth. Uh, that was a bit of space junk, but it was nice to look at. And I had to download an app to get to it. So people are downloading apps, whether they want to or not. You have to download an app when you rent a car. You have to download an app if you want to join the loyalty program of a restaurant. You have to download an app when you get a new bank account. You have to do it all the time, not to mention games. People want to play games all the time. Each one of those is going to be a new app. Even if you go to a company like Netflix, which has a primary app themselves, when you download one of their games, it's a new app each time. And their games are pretty great. So very, very addictive, unfortunately. Um, so... Then you think about projected mobile ad spend in 2023, which again, we're, we're, we're talking about 6 billion users. That is 60 bucks per user that is being spent worldwide on ads. So they're spending, uh, various companies are spending $60 per each one of us to try to entice us to buy something from them. Now, that sounds a little bit, I don't know, maybe depressing or creepy or something like that. But the truth is marketing's job is not to inundate you. Marketing's job is to try to find out who's most likely to buy their product and hopefully convert them into buyers. They're, they don't want to put something in front of you that you're not likely to buy because that just costs them money. Um, so I, I think it's important to understand uh, ads are what funds how these mobile apps get developed. These mobile apps are becoming the lifeblood of all e-commerce and it is only growing. It is absolutely not shrinking. Now, as we asymptotically approach the population of the earth as mobile users, this number at some point is going to have to change a bit in terms of its growth, but the prevalence in our society will only increase from here. Now, the good news is that 76% of mobile development teams intend to increase mobile app testing to offset rising risks and the costs of finding and fixing bad code. And that's uh, according to a report that Sauce Labs commissioned, which uh, we will have a link to here uh, in, the, in the slide deck. But the good news for those of us beleaguered uh, QA folks is that uh, testing is only increasing as the need for mobile apps increases. And I think it's important to think about the, the business that you're in and how important user experience and quality needs to be for various reasons. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you imagine uh, you're running an e-commerce company, then what's important? Do your users have to be loyal to you? No, they don't. So you have to make sure that you provide a better experience than your competitors. Otherwise you might lose your users. If you work for healthcare, is the user experience the most important thing? Honestly, not sure it is. The most important thing is to be able to claim process claims and make sure that the regulations and privacy laws are followed. That's probably far more important than protecting the user experience because the user experience uh, is kind of icing on the cake, considering that most healthcare is doled out by the employer, tied to the employer, 
and people can't just switch from one insurance company to another. So it's important to consider the context that you're in, understanding what are the primary risks to your business and what are the flows that you really need to pay attention to in order to protect the primary piece that your business cares about the most. In the case of a video game, a, a user will abandon it in minutes if they're not having a really, really delightful time. Um, so it's just important to understand your users' desires, understand their context. And one thing that I've seen uh, in my 20-year career, and I have been guilty myself, is that delivering quality mobile apps at speed is complex, especially when you come from one of these one, one, one particular kind of vertical industry and you go to a different one. So imagine going from an insurance company where regulation and privacy is paramount to an e-commerce company where user experience and smoothness of transaction is paramount. What does it change about the strategy that you take when you're testing your software? What are the different paths that you have to make sure are working every single day to protect the revenue that your company is generating? You can't just go from one to the to the next and say, I'm going to take exactly the same tool set I had at the last job and apply it to this. Even if in the end it comes down to Appium, the way you employ Appium is going to be vastly different. The, the way it scales, the platforms you're testing on, the different things you have to take into uh, account, the data is going to be vastly different. Uh, imagine thinking, just, just think about the whether or not you need breadth or depth in, in your testing. Think about, do you need to test everything in the user interface or can you do some of it via the API? Can you generate 30 to 40 mobile tests using uh, you know different data sets and then convert those into API tests so that they'll run a lot faster? Or do you need to keep them all on the device itself? Needless to say, it is all very complex. So, the challenge with the mobile SDLC is it's not quite the same as something like a web app. We have a web app, you can deploy a microservice that changes the API calls that are being returned to the front end. The front end can render those things a little bit differently. There's no review process. There's no packaged binary. There's no executable that you have to ship to an intermediary so that they can make sure that they, uh, they work properly. When you, when you are building your software, uh, you have to keep all of the, the, the whole test pyramid in mind. We'll, we'll talk about the test pyramid a little bit more in a bit. But it's difficult because I found a lot of teams that on mobile apps uh, don't even do unit testing. I found uh, difficulty in orchestrating the CI CD builds because there are so many different options out there for doing it on mobile than how we do it on web. Then there's the ability, the, the issue of, uh, especially with Android testing around different operating systems, different uh, different versions of different hardware. Um, usually with uh, Apple hardware, the path is very, it tends to be quite linear. You need to support different devices that are in the history. Once you upgrade it to a new device, the device cannot be downgraded back to a previous operating system. So you have to be very careful in when you're going to let older operating systems fall off. And once again, that's going to depend on your industry, not just your, your ability to, to be able to test these things. And it takes a lot longer to develop and execute functional tests when you're doing mobile, when, when you're developing for mobile. Fixing issues is costly because once you push the, put the binary in the market, it's, there's kind of no going back. You push it to the market uh, and, and it, it's out there Rolling back usually means fixing forward. You you can roll back, obviously, but but it, it is it is difficult to to manage that in real time, especially with the lack of feedback that you tend to get when you're doing mobile testing kind of on your own without an infrastructure partner. Then once you get it into production, operating it tends to be quite difficult because the tools that we use for monitoring web, uh, web apps quite tend to be quite different. Uh, from the tools that we use for mobile apps. So you have to understand a completely different language for monitoring, getting uh, mean time to recovery, prioritizing the errors, grouping, deduplicating, getting all the signals that you need, and, and then understanding 
what performance is like, like how does your app perform when the main application, the backend servers are all under load. These things in concept are very similar between web apps and mobile apps, but in reality, they tend to be quite different when when you get into the when you get into the play it almost feels more like a right like we're back in the client server world for those of us with a little bit more gray in our hair you understand there's a big package you have to ship and then you have to watch the back end servers as it's being hit so you're combining the most complicated pieces of a multi-tenant cloud-based server server-based application with the most complicated pieces of a client server application and if you're running a, a progressive app then you're introducing web as well so We've got the most complicated parts of all of software combined with exceedingly complicated and ever-changing hardware on two major platforms between iOS and Android. I mean, sometimes I wonder, how does this stuff ever work, uh, just given the, all of the challenges? But the truth is, uh, there's a famous story that goes around the Sauce Labs office around how um, when the CEO... Alan Miles was, you know, uh, essentially deciding whether or not to come to work at Sauce Labs, you know, because he was questioning, as some folks do, you know, testing, testing. What about testing? He saw a billboard for Wells Fargo, and and he noted that the billboard wasn't check out our savings rates, check out our interest rates, come look at our uh, wealth advisors. The billboard was for the app because Wells Fargo understood that it's a mobile first world and that the app is the most important thing. The app is the brand. The app does generate revenue. So every company is a mobile company. Every company is a software company. I'm gonna pause real quick because it looks like there's a question. Um, I'm gonna call upon Stephanie to help me out. What's the, Stephanie, is there a question? Yes, there is. Um, Chris has asked or has said they would love to hear your experience or opinion on mobile native versus mobile hybrid apps and the test mm. impact and differences. Test impact differences. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, and thank you, Chris. I, I, um, I mean, of course, I, of course, I'm going to say there are advantages and disadvantages to both. I think the what I like about native is that it tends to be, uh, and this is very very relative term. It tends to be simpler than hybrid in terms of developing, because you're kind of sticking in one place. You're 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 using Java Kotlin. You're developing the app. You package it up into a nice binary and you ship it. Hybrid, you have some percentage of it that's Java Kotlin, but then some percentage of it which is a portal back to the web world where you have to deal with things like browser standards and browser differences and rendering and W3C and, and uh, Java CSS, sorry, JavaScript, CSS, HTML. And when you introduce those variables, you get on the plus side, you get the ability to do completely dynamic content and sort of over the air app, up, app updates. So that if there's a part of the software that isn't working and it happens to be in the web portal part of it, then, hey, you can just fix it on the fly. You don't have to redeploy an app to get that working. However, uh, keeping up with all that, uh, there's a downside. If the web app is uh, unstable or shaky, or or it there's a release that, you know, maybe say say that the the, the web part of it points to an area of the web app that uh, the web app developers tend to favor desktop. I find that to be in general that if if someone is a web app developer and their primary job is making sure that it works on Windows or Linux, Chrome or Mac Safari, then sometimes they won't necessarily go through testing of that as, as it regards the, uh, the responsive part of the progressive part where it actually is rendering the web page on a, on a mobile app. So it changes the equation for both developers and testers. And the tooling in the testing world sometimes takes a little while to catch up to make sure that it can switch between the two. Uh, for a little while, I believe it was kind of, it, well, I wouldn't say it was impossible, but it was extremely difficult to sort of switch between those two worlds just because of the underlying technology. Um, but the advantages are clear in that you don't have to go through a review process every time you have to ship 
uh, a new piece of content for the web enable part of it. So it's, um, uh, I would say that it, I would base the decision on whether or not to, to go that route completely on the needs of the business and how much you need to have dynamic updates versus uh, the ability to drop in a package, uh, an entirely pre-built package. And, and I would base it, I would base it on that. I would base it on, you know, what's the likelihood that if you are releasing, this is probably an edge case, but if you're releasing uh, sort of dynamic web content, what's the likelihood you could sort of break the policies of the, the app store? Probably not very high, come to think of it. I don't even know why I thought of that. That's just me, my, my QA brain being activated, uh, saying what what's the worst case scenario. Um, so kind of a long-winded answer to say, you know, all the all the usual annoying answers like it depends and it's and both are difficult and it's context dependent but th that's the truth i would base it completely on um i'm sorry you're probably not looking for a decision point on that you're looking for a contrast and and what what's the difficulty in testing difficulty in testing is with hybrid apps they tend the testing tools and technology and strategies tend to be a little bit behind so you're kind of forging new ground and even if the ground is already forged the whole conversation is more complicated so I guess that's, that's my answer is I, I would be hesitant to be enthusiastic to sign up for a hybrid app testing gig, but I don't know, part of me would also like the challenge. So I don't know, it, it's, it's a, here's what I don't know. I'll, I'll be candid that I don't know the answer to one question is I do not know if you can use Espresso XEUI test to do hybrid app testing. And I'm a big fan of Espresso and XEUI testing. So um, I'd want to find that out first and foremost. But the truth is that hybrid web apps weren't really uh, so much in the big, in, in the zeitgeist when I was in industry. So um, I've only tested one hybrid app and it was exceedingly difficult. That's what I can say. Um, do we have another question? We sure do. Another question is, should unit testing for mobile apps use mock services, real services, or a mix? Mix. Uh, mix, 100%. Uh, uh, thank you, Stephanie. I think that I, I, I would, first of all, I, I, I'm quibbling because to me, the word unit test means no service. It, it, it's it's exclu I mean, that's not true. Uh, sorry. Let me not quibble with that. Let me just skip right to the answer. Um, I think for internal services, for external services, mock 100%. Like if you're in the unit testing world, if you are relying on a third party, which is, which by which I mean, not uh, a team that works on the same area of the product's microservice. I mean, if you are trying to test something that requires a Facebook or PayPal API, oh my gosh, mock it. Absolutely mock it. You're not going to benefit much from testing against those live services until you get further down, further down the the, the SDLC path. Um, if you're dealing with internal microservices that uh, you know an adjacent team is creating, you're working on a product family together, or you're dealing with uh, authentication stuff like that, I would definitely mock those in the unit test function, but I would start to introduce the live services pretty soon after that. And I would combine what I, what I would really encourage everyone to do is implement contract testing so that if you have a microservice that was written by someone that you have ready access to, I would write contracts against their API testing, their APIs so that you can always be sure whether or not your tests will basically still pass. I mean, is their API changing or is it staying the same? And if it's if it's changing and your tests haven't accommodated those change yet, then you might as well not even run your test because you can't rely on that that uh to be to be there. So I would say mock internal microservices early in unit tests, but try to try to introduce contract testing and real services early in the process. So I would say if we're talking around this diagram here, I would I would mock out services like PayPal, Facebook all the way through the, to near the end of the debug phase. I would introduce real services as soon as I could during the testing phase. But during the building phase when you're writing unit tests, I would I would mock 
I think I might mock literally everything. The job of a unit test is to verify the validation, uh, sorry, validate the function of the smallest piece of code that you can, which means necessarily mocking. And then as soon as you expand your scope beyond the unit, then you introduce live services uh, if you can. So kind of a, once again, long, long-winded roundabout answer, but I think it's, it's important. I think mocking is a very, very important and misunderstood topic. Um, and I think I would encourage everyone to, uh, to, to follow that because it, it's, um, it, there's nothing more frustrating than writing a whole bunch of code against somebody else's service and having your tests break because they didn't deploy their service properly or because they broke the contract overnight. And it just, it just sets you back. It sets you back. It distracts you. It takes you away from your, your main duty. I'd rather just mock everything and be able to make progress on my own so that you can guarantee your microservice won't break for somebody else. Um, so once again, long-winded answer, but I think that, I think that mostly covers it. Great. Thank you. We did have one other question, but actually we covered that in chat. So feel free to move on. All right. Great. So let's talk about test strategy. Um, during the build development release cycle, we have this evolution that's taken place over the last 20 years. Uh, when I started, you know, when, when I started the in, in this industry, I actually started in video games in 1994. And everything was waterfall, everything was manual testing. And we didn't, oh my gosh, there's no way we release monthly. <laughs> no way. <laughs> we released sometimes uh, the video games I worked on were some of those ones that took seven years to create. And once they ship, there's no patching. There's no over-the-air updates. There's no automatic, you know, please reboot your PlayStation to get this game updated. Once you ship it, that's it. And then in the, the aughts, the 2000s, we definitely started to see a little bit more test automation creeping in. In fact, my first job doing QA was I wrote an automated test on day one, and it was to test uh, an API, an API that that um, monitors websites. And we were doing waterfall. We were releasing approximately every three months. And as we migrated midway through that gig to agile, it was, in my opinion, because we were able to test successfully with automation and be confident of our releases that we were able to move to agile. I'm not sure the team, this, this may not be a universal truth, but I don't think the team I was on would have been able to move to agile without a fair amount of confidence in the automated testing. This is 2004, 2005. We never moved to weekly at that point. Um, where we are now, what's what's amazing to me is 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 kind of that during two thousand from two thousand five to two thousand fifteen, I feel like things changed a lot, but the bottom line didn't really change. It felt to me like test tools were being developed and shipped and tweaked and refined all over the place, and the way we did our job completely altered. But in my little universe of control. The shipping frequency didn't really change that much. We didn't really even talk about things like per commit releases or feature flags, that kind of thing. Those kinds of things started to come around. Yeah, 2015, 2016. My, you know, your experience may vary, but it's 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 fascinating to me just how things changed and in the web world to the point where now it is all just. It is, it is supposed to be a process that is automated entirely. It's like a train when it leaves the station, it's going to arrive at its destination and the next train leaves the station before the first train's fully out. So the, the evolution is fascinating, but at the same time, you have all these different variables and decisions that you have to make underneath in order to support those different releases because it, it's shocking to me, and it's probably shocking to anyone who's changed jobs in the last five years, how if you go from one company to the next, even if they're in roughly the same industries, couldn't be more different as, as to how it operates underneath and how they get software out. It reminds me of um, stories you hear about oil barons, oil pioneers in the the turn of the, the, the 19th to 20th century, how... Uh, they asked, how did you get the oil out of the ground? And the answer was, you just 
however buckets i don't know pumps whatever you did you use your hands uh, you you get the software out the door however you can and there are a grab bag of universals that people choose from some listed here but the truth is that every company is different and every company is vastly different we all speak the same language but you wouldn't think so sometimes um what we have decided at Sauce Labs is that we are going to be the platform for test to support any strategy, any test, any software development strategy. And that is more difficult than you would think. But we're happy to do it. The way this looks historically is you go from version control to, to continuous integration. You send it to cloud-based distribution you know, App Store, App Center, Flight, Test Flight. And then you ship it to Sauce Labs to, to uh, you know, to do the functional testing, and then it goes to the App Store. That's kind of the only way it's been able to be done. Um, what we're trying to introduce is mechanisms along the way, sometimes even before the CI process around API testing and contract testing. And then the ability to do functional testing on our devices in a way that you can control in a way that allows you to get access to multiple platforms and device types and older op older operating systems and all sorts of different mixtures of things and we actually can can run on uh we have many thousands of devices in our in our labs and we have nearly every combination you'd ever want of older operating systems with older devices and since we know that you are stuck once you upgrade an older op operate, uh, Apple device to a newer operating system, we keep the one, old ones around so that if you have a customer who has a problem, uh, then they can always drop back and, and use an older version. But then what we what we introduced was the ability to let you coordinate the distribution of your apps to real users pre-release, get them in the hands of real beta users so that you can put the app into the field and you only have one mechanism. You don't have to deal with app center test flight. You can, that we unify the, the distribution of the app to your beta users. And then the beta users can test your software without having to be trained in, you know, how to write up a good steps to reproduce or how to package up the artifacts or take a screenshot video of the uh, of of the click path that you use to get through the app, and submit that back. Uh, all of this done before you can go to the app store, and all of this gives you confidence that when you ship to the app store, it's not going to get rejected. They're not going to find anything glaring, and you you will be able to protect your user experience and your revenue when you ship it because you've just put it through that extra bit of testing at speed at scale that gives you the confidence you need. Now, the way we recommend, this is a test pyramid that's a little bit similar in spirit to the test pyramid that everyone's seen where you have unit testing and then integration testing and then the UI testing. We believe that the, the lower part, lower level of testing around um, you know early user interface, early integration testing, should probably be done on virtual devices. There's a lot of talk out there now about whether or not virtual devices should exist, whether they should, whether people should ever test on virtual devices. And uh, I think it's an exceedingly silly question to even think that virtual device testing is worthless. I, I sort of can't believe that intelligent people who virtualize every part of their computing life in the cloud could think, could look at a, a, a mobile emulator simulator and think, oh, that's worthless. I'll dismiss that out of hand. We recommend emulator simulator testing for, for testing your code paths. I mean, does it really matter that you're on bare metal or not if you're testing a code path that's uh, pretty much only sticking to the uh, Java Kotlin or, or uh, Objective-C Swift parts of the application? You know, you're, you're, you're tapping, you're executing APIs, you're getting answers back. You're not touching GPS. You're not touching the phone. You're not dealing with SMS. You're not worrying about the accelerometer. You're not dealing with the SIM card. You're just executing code paths. 
And the same folks who say you shouldn't do this are the ones who they probably embraced virtual machines early, early, early in the career. And it's just an odd thing to me to even to be debating about. I think that uh, the ability to scale up and scale widely with virtual device testing early on gives you such a, such additional information and signal and power in your testing process before you ever introduce the more costly and slow real devices. So at some point you do need to do real device testing because you've moved on from the theoretical, you wanna to go to the practical and you wanna make sure that you're, you're validating features across device models and form factors and actual hardware at that point. Uh, I don't know if I'd give a ratio to you know, I think that it depends once again on 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 uh, the sector that you're in, the vertical. It seems to me like, you know, if, if you're in if you're in a industry where you care about geofencing or something like that, then you want to do a little bit more, you know, 40, 60 virtual to real devices, where you're only testing the virtual devices uh, kind of early on in the process when you're trying to get through your your code paths and most basic user flows, and then later on you introduce the real hardware. If you're dealing with an app like um, like a game or something like that, game, game, game's a bad example because there's so many different kinds of games, but there are certain apps that don't need any part of the phone's hardware at all, except for just a cell phone signal. And those you should definitely test on real devices, but you could probably do that later and a little bit less. Mainly you'll want to do it for compatibility, backwards compatibility platforms that that you don't have the ability to test on your own because uh, most of the developers that we know tend to have two devices on their desk, one Android, one iPhone. And what we've also seen is that those developers tend to keep those same devices year after year after year. So developer, you know, is really excited to get their, their real device to work on. And then a year and a half later, they still got the same one, even though the market's released two or three ahead of them. If you're on Android, you have one Android phone from one manufacturer and it, it, there are several manufacturers of and Android phones. So you have to call someone else who might have the right Google Pixel device when all you have is a Samsung and it becomes exceedingly challenging. We've had a conversation with a bank who had a team of people, developers in Brazil, and they told the story that during COVID, they had originally had a cart with devices on it, 40 or 50 devices that they would run around the office uh, whenever it was testing time and everyone would sort of grab one and, you know, clean it off and have to get the fingerprints off from the, per the last person who did. And the last person forgot to plug it in. So they didn't want to, you know, they had to charge the phone and then they, they get the phone up and running and they figure out it's on an old operating system and they have to update the operating system and then update, deploy the new version of the app. And it's real easy to imagine that that a developer who has to test on a real app or a tester who has to test on a real device, they're probably spending 30, 40 minutes every time they want to do this just because they have to sort of do some homework to get the device up and running after they've uh, they've had it for a while. And this, uh, this bank that had a team in Brazil, they paid a kid uh, to ride around on his bicycle with a backpack full of phones from one developer's house to the next to deliver phones, to be able to do real device testing. And I, I think I can make the bold statement that that doesn't scale. It was a, it, it slowed things down. And uh, it, it, in my opinion, I think it's, it's time at that point to consider a cloud solution. I'm going to pause there to see if there's any questions for me. Yes, we have a couple. Um, John is wondering what your thoughts are on testing on different platforms to use separate frameworks, or should they all be incorporated into one? Um, I'm going to interpret that question. There's a little bit of ambiguity. I think I'm going to I'm going to interpret that, which is to say, is it important for a tester? to be able to use the same code to test Android or iOS so that I can have sort of the same language for my QA teams that they can use the same, either the same scripts themselves or at least the same commands to run between Android and iOS. That's that's how I interpret the question. Please speak up if, if, that, if that's not right. Um, and the, to me, the answer, 
I, I, I hate to do this again. It, the answer is it depends. It's going to depend on your team and your team's interaction with developers. If your team has an amazingly good relationship with developers and you kind of, you're a, you share a mindset, you speak the same language. Um, I actually don't know how much value there is in making sure that your, I'm going to just say Appium scripts or your framework is unified between the two different platforms. Because what I found, I've not yet found a, situation where a company's mobile teams are unified between iOS and Android. Usually you have an iOS team, you have an Android team. You have, if you have one QA team, they try to write a kind of universal framework to match between the two. And then they write scripts between those. I think if that's your situation, two separate mobile development teams and one QA team, yes, you probably should write for yourselves. But I found that if a team has their kind of their own testers and their own testers for iOS, their own testers for Android, I think it's probably better for the QA, the T, the testers on, or, or if there aren't testers and you're talking about sort of a, in general, how should people do this? I, I personally encourage XCY Espresso native app tests written in Kotlin Java or Objective-C Swift so that if if you need it, developers can actually assist in creating and executing and maintaining these scripts and they understand them, they understand what they do, they can help you debug them and create them and, and do all that stuff. It really depends on your situation. I think that there are a lot of drawbacks to trying to unify the iOS and Android world in one framework. It It's the kind of thing that demos beautifully, it works really well for a few months, and then slowly over time, you find out that you're kind of forking it between the two platforms anyway, because rare is the app that works the same way between two platforms. We found out many, many years ago that the audiences are fundamentally different between iOS and Android. And so the apps tend to have fundamentally different user experiences. So if your team makeup is one of really strong centralized QA, that doesn't super interact with the mobile developers. And we've seen that happen. It's, it doesn't sound, it, it sounds, it sounds maybe a little far-fetched the way I'm putting it, but it's certainly, we've seen it all the time. Unify, make, you know, to design the framework for the ergonomics of the QA group. If it's separate teams, th there's really no reason to unify that. It takes much more work to unify that abstraction layer than it takes to actually develop the scripts in, in the language. And then you can share them with the developers. Um, let me, let me keep going. I'll, I'll stop for questions here just to, uh, again in a minute. I've got 17 minutes left. So, um, once again, let's talk about the points of emulator simulator versus real devices, emulator simulator. Once again, massive scale, you're using sauce labs. You can go to, uh, in theory, I'm not going to say an infinite, infinite number, but you can go to like an arbitrary number of, of emulator simulator devices in an instant. We have a feature called Instant Boot Simulator, which means you can get access to an emulator simulator within seconds, like single digit seconds, because we pre-warm sessions and we're running them already by the time you summon one. Um, this, this, this slide kind of speaks for itself in my opinion. I think that it's very important that you understand uh, the difference between the two, but um, they each have their place. And anyone who tells you that it's worthless to test on emulator simulator is trying to sell you something. Um, so functional testing on multiple platforms, I think very, very important. And uh, to me, the second bullet point is probably the most important thing in this or any um, presentation about testing at all is I've spent my entire QA career trying to get people to understand how risk fits into their daily calculations of what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and this is once again, born out of a terrible mistake I made in the uh, mid 2010s, where I had an enormously talented team of automation engineers and I let them go wild testing um, the profile editing part of a particular app that we were working on. And I was then speaking to someone in business intelligence or business analytics uh, later who said that um, less than 1% of our users ever go to the user profile editing page and it doesn't generate a dime of revenue. 
you should have had those people either do literally nothing or um or work on a part of the app that actually generates revenue protects revenue and otherwise is something that the users care about i was not looking after the company's risk profile which means i was not looking after the company's revenue which means i was not looking after anything that the executives the board anyone actually or users cared about and I think that if you can bring the perspective of risk management and risk identification, risk mitigation to your process, then this will color not only how, how you test, but how effectively you test and possibly whether or not your, your function is considered strategic to the organization. And if you're reading between the lines, what I mean is, Testing using risk as your main measure might help you protect your job as long as other people understand that that's what you're doing and you actually have some wins you can point to and trumpet to the powers that be as evidence of the importance of testing. The evidence is all around us. We read headlines every day about different airlines, different ticketing platforms that are having trouble with various things that go wrong. And it's crazy because I feel like there's not a shortage of testers. There's a shortage of test strategy that is applied to this problem. Then there's a shortage of testers. So let's talk about testing in CICD between web and mobile. These things are very different. Um, with web, you tend to be pretty fast, whereas with mobile, you tend to be pretty slow. And that's partially because of the difficulty of testing mobile in parallel. It's also part of the nature of functional development for these kinds of things because the tests themselves take longer to write in, in my experience this is this is my experience and in the experience of, of several customers that we've spoken to the tests take longer they're a little bit more difficult to maintain and they are they execute more slowly and they don't scale as well now the good news is that they are a little bit more dependable than what we see in selenium scripts they're a little bit more i guess i'd call it deterministic there are not as many variables as there are in a web browser, but uh, it tends to be slow. Um, then there's the, the all important thing about the app store review. I mean, it takes days. So you need to make sure that you're accounting for those days of delay in your process. You really cannot, unless you're doing a hybrid app, do hourly releases with mobile. And mobile testing is just extremely difficult if you don't have proper tools. Um, I'm going to go a little bit further, stop for questions, and uh, we're almost, uh, we're actually uh, somewhat close to time to introduce our next session, so um, we'll go. I'm actually not going to talk very much through this. I, I, I just want to say, give a plug, say I love our app distribution and beta testing features. I think that this is the kind of thing that when I was in the industry, it would have been a fantastic tool because anyone out there who's ever tried to train testers or beta testers it's, it's so difficult to teach someone how to do steps to reproduce it is sometimes difficult to get grizzled qa veterans to write decent steps to reproduce um what we have here is something that allows us to uh, you you have a phone say you have a phone you're testing an app say you're at a theme park you want to order food at a kiosk that's going to be delivered at some certain point and you're inside of a ride because you don't care about the ride. Your, your kids enjoy the ride. You're going to order food for the for lunch. And inside the ride, you stop getting cell phone access. Wouldn't it be great if you could report that and say, hey, right here during this thing, I don't have cell phone access. And, and, and it will give a click path of the last few seconds that you've been working on. It'll tell you all sorts of deep telemetry about what's happening on the device as this is going on. It'll tell you about cell phone, cell tower connectivity, and um, even, even things like battery usage when you're, when you're out and about. And it will package all of that up into a bug report straight to JIRA and give you the ability to, to look at these issues that come in from your beta users and be able to fix things without having to teach people, like I said, hours and hours and go through all this work of you know, steps to reproduce and, and what were you doing at the time, that kind of thing. So this slide will be more of a leave behind for you to look at, but I think it's just a, it's a great product and a great enhancement to use when you're doing mobile app testing uh, in, in, your, in your daily work. 
And one of the last things we need to talk about is testing with observability. Now, um, you know, Sauce Labs doesn't actually have a feature flag or canary build uh, process unless you count app distribution for that kind of thing. But what, what we do have is the ability to help you gather stack traces, gather error crash reports, collate them, deduplicate them, symbolicate them, index them for easy searching, and put all that information within seconds into the hands of a developer. Imagine if you shipped a release and there was a really major problem with it. And then within seconds, you saw thousands of users were experiencing issues. Now, the first thing you can do is since you're testing behind a feature flag, I hope, you can just turn it off. One of the great underestimated, underspoken things about feature flags is that they are a built-in rollback mechanism. Most of the time, at least when I was coming up in my career, if you are developing software, there's an entire process around deployment. It takes scripts, it takes command line, it takes one poor person having to do one merge that takes eight hours, and then going through a series of steps in order to be able to deploy it to production. Fixing it, if something goes wrong, is that exact same process in reverse or fixing it forward, which looks the same way as it did to release it in the first place. If you code up a feature flag, you have your get out of jail free card already there. You're using feature flags. You can just turn something off. You coded your rollback mechanism when you were coding the features. It's fantastic. That way, way you can use the error crash reporting from Sauce Labs, roll back the feature, and be certain that you're looking at, if there's 4,000 errors, you don't have to pour through log files. You can look at one single root cause, tie that back to the line of code that started it or the piece of data that caused it and be able to get in there and do debugging right away. And if you do canary builds, you can further limit the blast radius to 1% of traffic, 2% of traffic. Once again, something that we don't do, we have partners that help with this. And if you combine feature flags, canary builds, and error and crash reporting, this is a recipe to always be confident that no more than uh, one, two, one half percent of your users are ever exposed to a horribly complicated issue that it's going to take you weeks to fix. These are what we consider best practices, especially when considering observability and testing. So um, our apps, our, our assisting assistance, our observability platform helps you every step along the way as you're running through emulator, simulator, sauce, orchestrate. What's missing from here is our API testing tool. What's also missing from here is in the debugging phase, being able to execute a test on a real device, gather the HTTP traffic that was generated by the test itself and convert that into an API test that you can then rerun without having to go through the entire rigmarole of a fun, an end-to-end -end functional test on a real device. So it, as you can see here, the, the various insights that you get at various points along the way can help you gain confidence that you're going to ship products that work, products that were designed according to requirements that your users are going to find delightful. Um, Stephanie, is there a question? I see one in the Q&A. Yes, we do have one. Someone is asking if you would recommend testing against the different wireless technologies or if that would be redundant. Um, I, I think, I, I would rephrase the question a, a tiny bit. I want to test how my app reacts under different wireless conditions. What I don't want anyone to do is test somebody else's wireless protocol. Like don't, like don't, don't, if you don't test somebody's router, don't, don't test whether or not the, the signal is carrying. What I would say is design a test so that you can shut down or turn on or off the wireless signal of any flavor that you care about and make sure that your app reacts the correct way and handles the errors appropriately and gives the user an experience that they expect. Uh, going back to the theme park example, I've been in a situation where the app acted like everything was fine, but in reality wasn't actually transmitting anything to the tower, even though it was sort of acting like it was. And to me, it should have been a little bit more 
some sort of yellow warning saying, look, you're, can, you're doing this work offline. You can still do it, but you're doing this offline and I'm not actually submitting your food order right now. So like I said, I, um, one thing I, I've been guilty of and have seen a lot in the past is people want to test to make sure that their app is working against the Facebook app. And, and they do this in such a complicated way that they end up testing the Facebook API itself. And I, I just don't, I don't recommend that. So I, I would just, I would recharacterize the question a little bit as, yes, I would want you to test with different wireless formats, but I don't want you to test the wireless formats. I want you to test to make sure your app behaves properly when the different wireless formats misbehave. That's a, that's the way I would put that subtle distinction, but I think it's a fairly important one. Um, here's a different look on the test pyramid as we see it. At the bottom, you see orchestration and infrastructure. This is stuff that you shouldn't ever have to think about, in my opinion. You shouldn't, as a QA tester, you, you should care about what your user is doing in your software and what the experience that they're having and whether or not that's affecting the revenue that you're generating or the risk profile to your business. You shouldn't have to think about, pardon me, you shouldn't have to think about like all of the calculus that goes into managing devices and managing all this stuff. And like I said, cleaning the fingerprints, somebody else's fingerprints off of a test device. Our relationship with our phone is rather shockingly intimate if you think about it like we're I'm the only one who ever touches my phone like even if uh even if my wife picks up my phone it's a little bit uh you know don't um these test devices kind of break that relationship that we have with these things and to me it's a little bit jarring or shocking to have to pick up a device that somebody else or a whole bunch of other people have been handling it's just a pain it seems to me like the best way to handle this would be to let the professionals handle that part because when it goes wrong, it costs you hours. And those hours are, are time that you're spending not focusing on your users at all. On top of this infrastructure layer, we built on all sorts of applications to help enhance the signal that you get from this infrastructure layer. So the ability to do visual testing, error reporting, cross-browser testing seamlessly with no change to your code except for some config. What we're then building on top, layering on top, is the ability to analyze using machine learning and statistical analysis to say, we've seen this failure several times over the last few days. This is something you might want to care about. Or while you are running a test, we noticed that the, an API was throwing a 404 error, but it did it got swallowed up by the app, so you didn't see it, but it was affecting performance. Or things like that. The ability to, you know, how many, how many of you, uh, I, I can't ask for a show of hands, unfortunately, but how many of you come into the work and come into work and you see that 50 of your... Um, 200 or 400 selenium tests are suddenly failing when yesterday everything was fine. Um, and then you analyze the first one and you see, hey, it was this problem. And you analyze the second one and hey, it was this, it was the same problem. You analyze the third one. Oh gosh, it's the same problem. And you figure out after an hour of analysis that if you fix one problem, either in your test framework or in the product itself, everything works again. What we're trying to do here is give you the ability to, to, to just do some of that analysis for you. You come into work and it says, uh, there were 50 failures, but they only followed one of two patterns. Here's the one you should start with because it was 47 of the fa 50 failures. Trying to analyze what actually happened in the test suite to make sure that you understand what's going on. So I think I've interspersed some of the questions uh, throughout the, the talk, but I wanted to make sure that we have a, another minute or two to see if there are any other questions. But um, essentially, that's all I've got for you today. I, I just wanted to make sure that we talked about mobile testing, how it's different from web, how uh, Sauce Labs helps you with various parts of it, and how we are looking to the future to try to help you actually solve your problems, not just sort of keep throwing scale at it. What good is throwing scale at it if we don't actually help you debug and solve problems like uh, like you need to? Thank you, everyone, first uh, for for uh, hosting, for letting me host. Thank for thank you for uh, listening to me drone on for an hour about this stuff. Um, I love talking about it, and I would love to contact um, any of you offline who who wants to talk more about this kind of stuff.